This is section 5.1, which is fundamental identities. We're going to talk about identities, basic trig identities, Pythagorean, cofunction, even odd, simplifying trig expressions, and solving trig equations. Okay, so the first two main identities that we're going to talk about are reciprocal and quotient. So these are on your identity sheet that I uploaded to Google Classroom. Um, it's one of those things that you have the sheet there to look at. You, you're going to want to memorize these, though, because if you always have to keep going back to look at the sheet, it's going to take you forever on some of these problems. So getting familiar with them and knowing that how to use them is going to be super important. So we know that like sine and cosecant are reciprocals of each other. So knowing that if you have sine somewhere in your, in your um, expression or equation, you can substitute in one over cosecant. That would be equivalent to it. Um, same thing if you have cosecant, you could substitute in one over sine. So those are our reciprocal identities. Another identity that you're going to use a lot of is tangent equals sine over cosine and cotangent equals cosine over sine. So those quotient identities are also ones you will see a lot of. Pythagorean identities. So the Pythagorean identities come from the Pythagorean theorem. So you have a visual down here. We know our x distance on the unit circle is cosine and our y distance is sine. And we know that our radius is 1. So our hypotenuse of our triangle is 1. So if you think about that, that means that cosine squared plus sine squared equals 1 squared, which is just 1. So that's where we get the Pythagorean identities. And then the other two here are derived from that same equation. So what I want you to know about with these is that you are not always going to see the Pythagorean identities written exactly like they're written on your sheet or right here. So what I want you to understand is you can think outside the box here. As long as you're using correct algebra, you can rearrange these equations however you need to to make appropriate substitutions in your problems. So for example, I could say 1 minus sine squared equals cosine squared. So that's still the Pythagorean identity, I just rearranged it. Or I could say 1 minus cosine squared equals sine squared. I could also say sine squared minus 1. So imagine I'm subtracting the 1 to the other side and I want to get cosine squared to the other side, so that would be negative cosine squared. And I could keep going forever and ever with these, but I just want you to understand you're allowed to do that. So if you see 1 minus sine squared, that's kind of something that should make your brain think, hey, this is part of the Pythagorean identity, and I know that I need to go look at my identity sheet and figure out what that would be equal to. So you're not always going to see it written as sine squared plus cosine squared or cosine squared plus sine squared. Um, so you have that flexibility to rearrange the equations. Okay, the next one is cofunction identities. So when you think back to when we were graphing sine and cosine, you know that we can shift. So if this is sine and this is cosine, we know that we can shift sine into cosine or cosine into sine and have it be the same graph. So that's where cofunction identities come into. So it's saying that we can shift one and have it equal another. So sine of pi over 2 minus theta is going to be equal to cosine, where cosine of pi over 2 minus theta is going to be equal to sine, and so on. So even odd identities, I found this little graphic with it, which I think helps understand why we have even and odd identities. So we it's tied into even and odd functions. So if we think of even functions, what we've looked at before are functions that are reflected over that y-axis. So if we have a point over here, we have a reflected point over here. So like if this is 3, we know that negative 3 is going to have the same height with an even function. So if you think about cosine, guess what? Cosine is reflected over the y-axis as well. So, is, so secant would be as well. So that's why for these, if you plug in a negative angle, you're going to end up with the same positive value out. So cosine of negative pi over 2 is going to be the same thing as cosine of pi over 2. So that's why it's equal to just plain cosine. Whereas odd functions, so if you think about sine, 
sign is reflected over the um, around the origin has ref um, reflection over the origin symmetry sorry symmetry about the origin and so um, that's why this is an odd function and we know with an odd function if we plug in a negative then we're going to get a, the negative opposite value out so that's why that's true for sine cosecant tangent and cotangent those would all be odd functions Okay, so first example here is using identity. So it says to find sine of theta and cosine of theta if tangent of theta equals three and cosine of theta is less than zero. So we have lots of identities we can use. Um, so if I know just tangent, that's all I know, and I look through my identities that we've just talked about, the only identity that I have that deals with just tangent and no other identities would be my, or sorry, has one other identity that I could solve for. I'm going to do 1 plus tangent squared equals secant squared. So that means I can substitute in that tangent's 3. So this would be 1 plus 3 squared equals secant squared. So 3 squared plus 1, that's just 10. So we know that secant squared is 10. So that means that just secant would be plus or minus the square root of 10, but it tells us that cosine's negative. So if we know that cosine's negative, that means that secant is also negative. So that means we can get rid of that positive. We know it's just gonna be negative square root of 10. Okay, so now if we want cosine, we know cosine's just the reciprocal of secant, so it'd be one over, I'm gonna put the negative out front, so negative 1 over the square root of 10. Now, I know your book and some of your My Math Lab leave it like that, but remember, I would always prefer that we rationalize the denominator, so we'd write it as negative square root of 10 over 10. So that's cosine. So now we know tangent and we know cosine, so I'm going to use the quotient identity. I'm going to use that tangent is equal to sine over cosine. And I'm trying to find sine on this one, so I'm gonna rearrange this, and I'm gonna say tangent times cosine equals sine. And we know tangent is three, and we know cosine is negative one over square root of 10. So if I multiply those together, I get negative three over square root of 10 is equal to sine, or we could say negative three square root of 10 over 10. So that's my sine and my cosine given that information. So we can use identities to solve and find missing pieces. Okay, the next one is simplifying by factoring and using identities. So this is where, this is, I think this is why I love um, simplifying and verifying trig identities, but it brings so much previous math that you've already learned. So if you think about this, we have an expression where we have cosines here and we have a cosine here. So we've been trained, if we have something that is common in both terms, we can factor out that common thing. So I'm gonna factor out a cosine, which is gonna turn the cosine cubed into just cosine squared. And this term would just become sine squared. So this is where you need to start recognizing identities. And if we see in here, we know cosine squared plus sine squared is equal to one. So this would be cosine times one, which is just cosine. So we took a complicated expression and we simplified it. When we get into our next section, we're gonna talk about verifying. Verifying is easier because you know what you're trying to end up with. Simplifying can be tough because you're trying to simplify it, but you don't necessarily know when you're done. But in this case, if we can get it down to a single, single function, that's pretty good. Okay, example four is simplifying by expanding and using identities. So I'm simplifying this expression. So the first thing I notice is in the numerator, I have a difference of squares. So I'm actually going to multiply that out, which would give me cosecant squared minus one because of the difference of squares, my middle values will cancel, over cosine of squared, cosine squared. 
So now cosecant squared minus one is part of my Pythagorean identity. So if I rearrange um, cosecant squared minus one would be equal to cotangent squared. So this would be cotangent squared over cosine squared. So then what I like to do sometimes when I have a trig function on the top and the bottom is sometimes I like to separate them into multiplication. So I'm going to write this as cotangent squared times 1 over cosine squared. And the reason I'm going to do that is because cotangent squared, I can use my quotient identity. So even though it's squared, it's still going to be cosine over sine, but they're both going to be squared as well. So I'm going to turn this into cosine squared over sine squared using quotient identity times my 1 over cosine squared. And then because we're multiplying here, I can cancel the cosine squareds. And I have 1 over sine squared, which is oops, cosecant squared. Okay, and then our last example is we are going to solve. So we're going to find all values of x in the interval 0 to 2 pi that solve this equation. So the first thing I notice is I'm going to, I always like to turn things into sines and cosines. That's a strategy as we're working through these. So I have sine, cosine, and tangent. So I'm going to turn the right-hand side into sines and cosines because it's tangent. So I'm going to write sine over cosine. And you'll notice we have the same denominators. So we can kind of cancel those out and just look at the numerators. Sine cubed equals sine of x. Now, we don't want to divide both sides by sine because we could lose potential answers in that. So anytime we have like the same trig um, function on both sides, we want to just add or subtract to get them onto the same side. So this is going to be sine cubed minus sine. And then I can factor out a sine. So this would be sine times sine squared minus 1. So now this is, again, where we can think of Pythagorean identity. Sine squared minus 1 would be equal to negative cosine squared. So now I have, oops, I have sine times negative cosine squared equals 0. Now, because of our zero product property, remember if any time we have two factors, two multiplying factors that are equal to zero, we can set each one of them equal to zero. So we can say sine of x equals zero and negative cosine of x equals zero. So let's start with the negative cosine squared. So if we divide both sides by zero or divide by both sides by negative one to make it positive, it'd stay zero and we square root zero, still zero, so we could say cosine equals zero. Okay, that's gonna be a problem, because if you go back to our original equation, we were dividing by cosine. So if cosine's equal to zero, we don't have any, we don't have any, we can't do that. So this would be like an extraneous solution that we have, so we would say no solutions come out of that. But then here we have sine of x equals zero. So you're thinking where on the unit circle is your y value, because sine is y, equal to zero. That would be at zero pi and pi. So that would be our answer to that solution, or to that equation, sorry. Okay.